Welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to this launch event for uh, our ongoing project at Chatham House on rebuilding international economic cooperation, uh, led by our team in our global economy and finance uh, program at Chatham House, led by Creon Butler. Um, fantastic that you can join us today for this uh, conversation. We've got a packed and fairly complex program um, ahead of us here. Um, I'm going to be turning over shortly in my uh, remarks to my colleague Creon to get him to uh, introduce um, the papers that we've produced in time for this launch event. My job uh, will be at the beginning just to welcome you all as you're coming into this meeting uh, and then to moderate and share the second half uh, of this meeting. Um, all I want to say is obviously I'm delighted that as an institute We've been producing a series of papers as well as a number of events we've been running to mark this really transformational moment, potentially, for global economic cooperation in the wake of or through the COVID-19 pandemic. We can see this obviously being a central topic of conversation in the World Bank IMF spring meetings taking place this week in coordination with this event that we have today. Uh, or let's say coinciding with this event that's taking place uh, today. Um, uh, and I think a lot of the topics that have been developed uh, by uh, a great and stellar group of paper writers who you will be meeting shortly and that Creon will be getting to share their top ideas with you, you'll see that uh, there are a number of dimensions that we're going to really have to focus in on over the coming months and years in order to make sure that we do indeed build back better or emerge uh, stronger and more resilient from this crisis, rather than use it as a gateway to greater uh, insecurity uh, or even at worse uh, uh, economic confrontation. Um, uh, I do want to uh, say a huge thank you to the paper writers who you will be meeting shortly for their contributions, some directly involved with Chatham House, some colleagues of ours from the private and public sectors. Thank you very much for, uh, uh, for sharing your ideas through the papers that we'll be discussing. A big thank you to our three distinguished panelists who will be joining us in the second half of this meeting at the top of the hour, 4 p.m. GMT. Uh, uh, Lord Hammond, Philip Hammond, Dame Diane Julius, and Professor uh, Raghuram Rajan, um, they'll have an opportunity to give their reactions to the papers and uh, then also engage a bit in some of uh, uh, conversation with all of you who are joining us today uh, as our guests and uh, as our members as part of this uh, conversation. Reminder, this is on the record. It's being live streamed as well. Um, so please uh, have a good uh, program. I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Creon, and not use up any more of our precious time. There's a lot to get through. Creon, over to you. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Robin. And uh, while we're showing the, uh, the slide with uh, the um, the presenters of the various papers. I'll just say a few brief words by way of introduction. Uh, first, let me add my thanks and uh, those of my co-editor, uh, Stephen Pickford, uh, for all the work that's gone into producing uh, the briefing papers. The project was actually conceived uh, towards the end of the Trump administration, uh, when the prospects for international economic cooperation uh, looked pretty bleak, uh, but the need for it was clearly growing and growing fast. Uh, and the idea was to ask a group of independent experts to come up with specific practical ideas, not just in response to the issues where there was a need for immediate action, but also on issues where successful cooperation could help rebuild the system as a whole. Now, fast forward to today, and fortunately, prospects are much better now, uh, but the challenges are still considerable. Uh, seven of the briefing papers have already been published and are available on the Chatham House website under the Global Economy and Finance program page. One more will be published after this event, uh, but we also hope to continue with this format beyond uh, these uh, eight papers uh, that we have uh, already in train. With all the published papers, you will also find the, the bios of uh, the authors uh, who are speaking today. Uh, the papers group quite neatly into four that address uh, macro financial issues and three that address structural economic issues, and then one which looks at the kind of overall um, challenges of um, uh, how to do international economic cooperation. The plan is therefore to have three segments. Uh, the first will have presentations from Neil, Isabel, David and Rebecca, followed by a quick Q&A. Uh, and then we'll have presentations from Chris, 
uh, Lauga and Simon, again followed by a Q&A. And in the last segment, Stephen will present the emerging ideas from uh, the paper he and I are working on. Um, in view of this, I would really invite uh, the audience to start posting questions um, through the Q&A function as soon as you are inclined to do so. We'll aim to pick them up either um, in the, um, the author segment or subsequently. Um, we're obviously going to be very tight for time, so each of the authors has very kindly agreed to keep their presentation to five minutes of, or less. Right, um, let's move to the first paper, which is presented by Neil Shearing, Group Chief Economist at Capital Economics and Chatham House Associate Fellow. Uh, Neil, over to you. Thanks very much, Crean, and, and hello, everyone. Um, I'll, I'll keep my remarks, the remarks quite short, uh, given, given how much we've got to get through. But um, I think the, the paper that, um, that I put together makes three essential points, really. Um, and it's focused on fiscal policy and the role of the state uh, in regards to fiscal policy in the post-pandemic world. Um, the first point the paper makes is that policymakers, government should stay the course in terms of the support that they're providing to economies. The danger of withdrawing fiscal support too soon far outweighs the costs of leaving it in place for too long. Um, now, actually, there's almost universal agreement on this. Uh, as you say, Korea, when we conceived of this project several months ago, uh, this is one of the, the kind of dividing lines. How much support should you should you put in place and how long should it stay there for? I think there's now almost universal agreement on this. And in fact, the parameters of the, the debate around this point have uh, shifted substantially um, by the sheer scale of, of the Biden stimulus plan. Uh, and perhaps inflation is now a much greater risk in the US. Uh, and at the very least, I think we can uh, probably agree that uh, the Biden plan is perhaps badly targeted. Uh, it's huge, but perhaps bad, badly targeted. We can get onto some of those issues uh, in the in the Q and A, perhaps. But I, I still think the essential point remains: the dangers of withdrawing support too soon outweigh the costs of leaving it in place for too long. Uh, and I think it's also true that most governments in Europe are perhaps still doing too little on the fiscal side of things. Um, so that's the first point. The second point, um, and this I think is a. Uh, um, relates to kind of what happens uh, as economies start to recover from the pandemic, is that the, the debate needs to shift towards the role of the state and by extension fiscal policy uh, and the role it should play in the post-pandemic world. Um, and I think there are two points here. Um, the first is that support should gradually be uh, moved away from blanket support for the whole economy towards targeted support for the sectors that are most um, affected and the individuals and the companies that are most affected by the pandemic. And I think that's a failing of the, 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 the Biden plan. Um, and the second point is that there's gonna be significant structural adjustment as a result of um, this pandemic. I don't buy the idea that we're gonna have permanently weaker economic growth at a global level as a result of the pandemic. I think this crisis is different, but there will be significant structural adjustments. Some sectors will shrink, others will grow. Um, and there's a question about how much, what role government should play in facilitating and guiding that, um, that, that adjustment. And the conclusion the paper reaches is that as much as possible should be left to the markets. Government's role should be really reduced to providing a platform for that transition, both through uh, skills, but also through public investments. Uh, and of course, real interest rates at the moment, are negative, um, pretty much as far as you can see across the curve. Uh, it's a once in a century opportunity to, to build out public investment, but that's the that's where the government's role should be focused on the uh, in terms of the transition uh, to the post pandemic economy as much as possible, leave the rest to the market. Um, and the third point the paper makes is that there's a need for international coordination amongst these uh, these plans. Now, that's partly because if you can optimize fiscal policy. It's a at a national level in as many countries as possible, by definition, you're going to optimize the global recovery. Um, but I think there's also an important subsequent point, which is that as much as possible, if there's coordination amongst fiscal plans, um, you stand a better chance of it avoiding imbalances in the, in the global recovery. Uh, China's surplus was the biggest uh, as a share of global GDP last year than it has been since the run up to the global financial crisis. The US deficit has blown out the counterparts of that Chinese surplus. All of that is being framed by ongoing uh, 
US-China decoupling. And I think that those strains and tensions between Washington and Beijing have been accelerated by the pandemic and haven't been changed as a result of um, Joe Biden's election. So it's playing out against this backdrop of decoupling. And, and without co uh, cooperation and coordination in fiscal plans and economic policies, I think there's a risk that, that exacerbates those, those existing strains. So there, there you go, three main points. Keep support in place, um, uh, shift that support to the most affected sectors as economies start to recover, leave as much of the transition as possible to the market and with governments providing a platform in terms of skills and investments and coordinate as much as possible between different economies, particularly to avoid um, imbalances emerging uh, and potentially strategic rivalries emerging too. Neil, thanks very much. And thanks for um, such a succinct uh, presentation. I think on your last point, it's really quite interesting when you look at the um, G20 communique this, this week, um, there's quite a lot of good stuff in there, but the one area they don't seem to be getting into very far is this whole question of fiscal policy coordination. And that I think just illustrates how, how difficult that area is likely to be, although really important. Excellent. Um, now I'd like to move to uh, our next presenter, and that's uh, Isabel Matias Ilago, uh, Managing Director and Global Head of Official Institutions Group at BlackRock. Isabel, over to you. Uh, thank you, Creon. Uh, hello, everybody. So the, the paper that uh, uh, Stephen and Creon invited me to write focuses on global liquidity. Uh, and my starting point there was uh, actually what's the problem? Uh, you know, uh, contrary to the global financial crisis, we didn't see a, a lasting dash for a dollar. We didn't see, well, we did see massive capital outflows in, in, in March out of emerging markets, but they were reversed very quickly. Uh, and soon most central banks in emerging markets uh, started reaccumulating reserves. Uh, and we only saw a handful of uh, sovereign defaults, which largely reflected uh, pre-existing conditions. And that was thanks to uh, policy innovations, both by advanced country central banks, in particular, very massive, uh, uh, not just government bond purchases, but also corporate bond purchases, which, uh, you know, help push capital back into emerging markets. Uh, then we had over a dozen emerging market central banks getting into the QE business uh, themselves, which, uh, you know, uh, uh, hadn't been possible typically in previous crises. And then for low-income countries, we had the debt, debt service suspension initiative, DSSI, agreed by the G20 at the behest of the heads of the IMF and the World Bank very early on, which, which, which provided a lot of uh, uh, help. Having said that, when, when one looks uh, a, a bit forward, uh, not all is well, and there are actually some significant difficulties that, that, that really uh, are going to require uh, more coordination than we've seen. Uh, there were three such difficulties at the time I wrote the paper. There's now a fourth one, so let me go through them. Uh, the first one is we need to, to transition from what were clearly liquidity problems last year to what in a growing number of cases are, are turning out to be debt sustainability problems. More than half of the low income countries are now uh, estimated to be uh, uh, near a state of debt distress or in outright debt distress by the, by the IMF and the World Bank. Um, uh, and then there's countries that are not facing debt sustainability issues right now, but very well might in the future if, and that's the second problem, uh, if they suffer from long COVID, or to put it differently, a protracted period of uh, below potential growth, a little bit like we saw happen in Europe after the global financial crisis, uh, you know, as a result of not being able to deploy enough policy support to the recovery. And so leading to a lot of scarring and leading to an inability to grow fast enough to pay back uh, the increase in debt. And just as a reminder, in the advanced world, everybody is, uh, you know, focused on low interest rates. But if you're, you know, a, a large emerging market, you're borrowing at 9, 10% on your, on your local currency. Debt. So you need to grow very fast to pay it back. Um, third uh, issue that needs to be dealt with is policy normalization. Policy normalization, both the direct, the sorry, the indirect impact of policy normalization in, in the advanced countries on 2EM, but also policy normalization in their own countries. I mentioned a lot of central banks uh, in emerging markets engaged in uh, quantitative easing. Uh, 
uh, that does bring about a risk of fiscal dominance. So far, they've been able to do it without being punished, without fears of uh, 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 inflation getting out of control. But obviously, the longer it lasts, the longer, the, the more complicated it's going to be to get out of it. So how do we do that? Um, and then a fourth problem, which didn't exist uh, at the time I wrote the paper uh, late last year, uh, but is now a, a, a real one, is U.S. exceptionalism. Uh, now, there's lots of good things to the, 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 the extraordinary uh, uh, magnitude of the U.S. policy response to COVID, frankly, both in terms of vaccine and, and the amount of stimulus that's been already agreed and, and the additional one coming down the pipe. But what that's doing is making the U.S. a very attractive uh, investment destination. And by contrast, emerging markets, much less so. And in fact, the latest IMF forecast indicates that if you exclude China, emerging markets are going to grow less than the U.S. Uh, uh, this year, which is extraordinary. And of course, we have the impact of U.S. rates being higher, which is also a problem for emerging markets. So uh, what are the solutions? I uh, suggested uh, in my paper thinking along four lines. The first one was liquidity provision via an allocation of uh, special drawing rights. Uh, that's a box that we can tick now because it's been endorsed by the G20 and the IMFC. It should happen pretty quickly. The remaining homework to do there in, is in finding a way to recycle the vast majority of these $650 million, uh, 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 billion dollars SDRs that will not be going to countries that need them. So how do we organize a recycling? There's some work to do there, but there seems to be support for that. So that's, uh, that's good, but it's not going to be straightforward to make it work. The second dimension is debt restructuring. Uh, as I mentioned, we need to get beyond the, the, the DSSI. The G20 has now agreed a, a so-called uh, um, uh, comprehensive framework, but that again is seen very much just as a successor to the DSSI. It doesn't cover <clears throat> emerging markets, for example, uh, and we have yet to see how it's gonna work. Very importantly, uh, the role of the IMF and the World Bank in coming up with credible debt sustainability analysis, uh, again, that's going to be essential to make that work, uh, but pretty well in train, I would say. Third dimension is to really have a framework to help uh, emerging markets uh, deal with policy normalization. Um, and here I would flag that it's extraordinary that the IMF has disbursed so little money out of its you know, one trillion war chest uh, it's disbursed just above uh, 100 billion, uh, of which practically none to emerging market countries. There is a problem here. Uh, emerging markets don't want to borrow for the, from, the, from the IMF. They're going to need help. And the IMF really has a role to play there in devising new tools, new policy frameworks that help uh, emerging markets avoid long COVID and avoid fiscal dominance and avoid getting into really serious problems. Uh, so lots of work to do there, which unfortunately doesn't seem to be frankly on the, on the menu, judging from the uh, various communiques uh, issued this week. And then last area, um, emerging market capital development. Ultimately, these countries are going to need private finance. There is a, 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 one, a once in a lifetime opportunities, I'm tempted to say, given all the focus among global investors on green and sustainable. Um, there's a lot to do in that space in emerging markets. And so some coordination both at G20 level and using the MDBs, the, the multinational development banks to, to, to really give a big acceleration to the issuance of green and sustainable debt uh, by emerging countries could be could be a way to make them more attractive to to to, to really facilitate their financing over the coming decades, given uh, all the spending needs that have been well uh, diagnosed. Uh, so let me stop here. I think we're 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 in a much better place than than just three months ago, but there's still a lot of work to do, and none of it is easy. Isabel, thank you very much. And I think, um, I mean, you laid out the, the agenda and sort of possible directions, but I think your points link very neatly to our next paper um, uh, by David Lubin, um, Managing Director and Head of Emerging Market Economics at City, and also an Associate Fellow at Chatham House. And he looks at some of the longer term issues um, uh, for emerging market debt. So David, over to you. Thanks very much, Creon. Thanks everyone for joining uh, today's conference. Um, so I've written a paper about issues to do with emerging markets debt, I think it's very important to split 
the idea of emerging markets debt into two buckets. One is a very familiar bucket, which is external debt or foreign exchange denominated debt. And the other is a much less familiar bucket, which has to do with problems associated with domestic public debt in emerging markets. And I think um, that what I'm trying to do is to kind of make a couple of suggestions about each of those buckets. If I talk first a bit about the, ex the problems to do with external debt, um, I think there's a tendency among many market participants, many policymakers to panic about the idea that there is an imminent emerging markets external debt crisis. I don't really buy that. I don't buy it partly because when I look at the ratio of external debt stocks to stocks of external assets, reserves for example, they don't look that stretched by historical standards. In addition to that, commodity prices are currently very high, emerging markets current account balances are currently very strong. Um, uh, and although US real interest rates have risen recently, they are still by historical standards extremely low. And so for all of these reasons, the idea of a kind of imminent systemic external debt crisis across emerging markets seems to me to be just incorrect. Um, in a way, it's precisely because real US interest rates remain so low that I think what we need to do is concentrate more on avoiding an excessive buildup of external debt. Because historically speaking, it's when US interest rates in real terms are very low that capital gets pushed towards emerging economies. I mean, if you look at the issuance of dollar denominated euro bonds in 2020, the, 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 the amount of issuance last year was in excess of $800 billion. It was up 10, 15% compared to 2019. So the, 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 the challenge I think is to limit the buildup of excessively large stocks of external debt. And the, the uh, recommendation I make in my paper is just to use a very simple but incredibly uh, valuable framework that exists within the IMF, which is the Assessing Reserves Adequacy Framework, as a way of uh, guiding countries in limiting the buildup of external debt. And I think that both the IMF, policymakers themselves, and international bodies like the Financial Stability Board should be drawing more attention to the Assessing Reserves Adequacy Framework to ensure that everybody understands that at the end of the day, risks associated with external debt are minimized by encouraging countries not to borrow too much in the first place. And the, the, the reserves adequacy framework, I think, is a, an incredibly useful tool to help, uh, to help guide policymakers and market participants towards thinking in that way. The problems to do with domestic debt are much more subtle and subtle because we just don't have historical experience of dealing with problems to do with, ex with to do with domestic debt, you know, all of our experience over the last forty years is that you know, developing countries have have debt crises that are to do with shortages of dollars. Brazil, South Africa, for example, cannot be said at the moment to have problems to do with shortages of dollars, but I think they can be said to have a, a very serious problems to do with the buildup of their public domestic debt. I think there are two vicious circles at work. One is a vicious circle that links declining potential growth with rising domestic public debt. You know, weak growth pushes up, puts upward pressure on public debt, but rising public debt puts downward pressure on potential growth. So you have a kind of vicious circle there. There's another vicious circle too, which has to do with the relationship between the steepness of the yield curve, which in these two countries' cases uh, is exceptionally steep, and the effective exit by foreign portfolio managers who have just lost willingness to buy these countries' domestic bonds. These two vicious circles combine in, in really nasty ways to create a situation where Countries like Brazil, I mean, I, I, you know, maybe in a way I'm only talking about these two countries, but these are two such, such important countries that if they have problems, they are systemic problems or potentially systemic problems. 
that um, we need to find a way to uh, get rid of the problem that is created by the fact that both of these countries have long-term real interest rates, which are way higher than their potential growth rate. And I think that one possible way out of that trap is to make GDP linked bonds uh, more of a thing, uh, not just for developing countries, for developed countries as well, but particularly for developing countries, because I think it's only by introducing GDP linked bonds that we can kind of break that vicious circle down. Um, and actually, the, you know, the, the fact that GDP linked bonds are not yet a feature of uh, public sector debt management in the developed world, I think is a huge constraint because as we've seen in the past, for example, in the introduction of collective action clauses into emerging economies debt contracts 20 years ago, it takes support from the developed world to make a change in the developing world acceptable to market participants. So I would very much encourage um, uh, developed country governments to start consider issuing GDP linked bonds as a way of making them more acceptable throughout international capital markets, which in my view would be a way of breaking down the vicious circles that I think are of tremendous, you know, that, that, that create tremendous threats to financial stability in, in countries like Brazil and South Africa. David, thank you very much. And uh, it'd be interesting to hear um, Philip Hammond's views later on on uh, GDP, GDP linked bonds. And that's whether that's one of the things you might have considered or might consider today. Thank you very much. And now, if we could move to the, um, the fourth in our macro financial area, um, and that's uh, a presentation by Rebecca Emerson, whose partner Oliver Wyman in London, and her paper is joint with Till Schurman, who's a partner of Oliver Wyman in New York. So, uh, Rebecca, over to you. Great, thank you, Creon. Uh, lovely to be here this afternoon. The, the paper Till and I wrote um, looks at the COVID-19 um, experience last March in the financial markets as an opportunity to view it as a stress test and look at how the banking reforms have stood up and opportunities for them to be better. So just taking a step, taking a step back, when I was looking back over what had happened in 2008, I recalled looking forward to a relaxing Sunday lunch with old friends, enjoying the late summer sunshine on a weekend in September. But that lunch never happened. Instead, I had to make my excuses and I spent the day reviewing the financial prospects of a bank, which ended up being taken into government-backed recovery before sunrise on Monday. In the autumn of 2008, weekends were timed that banks moved into the netherworld of state rescue or, or forced merger. But roll forward to spring 2020. A Monday catch up with a banking client told a very different experience. Yes, they'd had some long nights and weekend working during the last two weeks of March, beginning of April. However, the most recent weekend had been a massive win. The bank had successfully processed more than 50,000 requests for loans backed by the government's coronavirus guarantee scheme. So 12 years later, in a completely different crisis, a large shift from banks as the source of the economic crisis during the global financial crisis to having an important role to play in transmitting government support for stricken businesses in the COVID crisis. So what has changed in the intervening 12 years? Significant reforms to the bank regulatory framework have been undertaken. These forms were discussed, proposed and ratified by the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision but implemented by local regulatory authorities. These reforms significantly increase the amount of capital and liquidity which banks were required to hold against their lending activities. The reforms strengthened the global banking system, but they also had a number of unintended consequences. Among other things, they allowed a degree of balkanization of bank capital and liquidity rules and the creation of a patchwork of local level regulation that has led to uncertainty and inefficiencies. The COVID-19 shock in March, 2020 was the first real stress test of these reforms. If the objective of the banking reforms was to avoid a repeat of the bank failures of 2008, then the Basel Committee regulatory framework can be considered to have worked well, at least so far. The reforms have clearly made the banks more resilient 
not only through additional financial reserves, but also through improved risk management and public disclosure. However, there are nonetheless already lessons to be learned from the COVID-19 stress test that could further strengthen banks ahead of the next crisis. The Financial Stability Board only a few weeks ago announced it would carry out a review in conjunction with the standard setting bodies of the regulatory system's performance during the pandemic. The review would examine, among other things, the use of capital and liquidity buffers by financial institutions and how well crisis management and operational resilience arrangements have functioned. We welcome this review as achieving as much consensus as possible will help improve preparedness ahead of the next crisis or indeed another wave of COVID. In addition, consensus at the G20 level on the lessons to be learned will be crucial in maintaining the maximum possible degree of regulatory coherence. In our paper, we review the performance of the regulatory framework in the period up to the pandemic and look at some of these unintended consequences. We pose four questions to be addressed by the FSB review to be effective. Number one, burden sharing. Where should the private sector self-insurance end? In other words, from the private banks and the public sector insurance begin to the central banks. Number two, size. How big should these financial buffers be? What level of stress should be covered? And for how long should the protection last? Number three, disclosure. What should be publicly disclosed about the buffers? When and how? And number four, use. When should the buffers be used? Who determines when they're used and who agrees to do so? And how quickly do these buffers need to be rebuilt after being drawn down? A thorough review of the calibration of bank capital and liquidity buffers, fully taking into account the experience up to the pandemic and the exceptional circumstances of the pandemic itself would improve confidence in the banking system and will be crucial to the future international coherence. Continued confidence in the international banking system would also benefit the industry by lowering society's overall costs. Rebecca, thank you very much. And um, I think that illustrates another issue where in a way we got through the crisis uh, and it kind of worked, but unless we agree on why it worked, uh, we can have a big problem later on, essentially, in terms of how the regulatory framework evolves from now. Now, um, given where we are on time, what I want to do actually is to keep going with the author presentations, because I know that um, some of them are on uh, really tight schedules. And then um, maybe before uh, we come to Stephen's presentation, we can I can put in the, the questions and we're getting some good questions coming through. So if I may, um, I'd like to move on to our, our next paper, and this is in the sort of the three structural economic issues. And this is a paper presented by my colleague, uh, Chris Sabatini, uh, Senior Fellow for Latin America at Chatham House. So Chris, if I may pass to you. Thank you, Crian. Thanks for the opportunity to contribute. Um, my paper is on uh, the informal sector. Now, what we mean by the informal sector uh, is obviously uh, workers that work off books um, that either work in, say, small businesses, uh, self-owned businesses, as well as a growing number, up to 35% of the informal work, working class, uh, work in actual um, formal firms, but do it off books. The reason why I focused on this is if you follow it, uh, obviously the informal sector has borne a large brunt of the uh, effects of COVID, both in terms of um, the uh, decline in income for a number of reasons, given the sector of the economy they work in, given the fact that many are simply on the threshold of poverty, living day-to-day -day wages on day-to-day -day wages. And second, because they simply don't have access to formal insurance programs. Unemployment, um, oftentimes if they're in a publicly funded health program, they have only have access to the spotty public health care and without access to formal pensions. As a result of this, uh, the ILO has estimated that uh, overall about there'll be about a 60% uh, decline in income of those employed in the informal sector globally. Uh, as well as in lower income and middle income countries, about an 80% decline in their incomes and standard of living as a result of COVID and the associated lockdowns. Now, question here is, of course, is uh, what is being done? Because it is a significant percentage of the population. According to the ILO, 
Uh, they're about 60% uh, of the global workforce, or about 2 billion people globally work in the informal sector, not just in the developing world, although that's obviously the bulk of it, but also the developed world, the so-called gig economy workers. We're seeing this play out very much in, in uh, the UK recently with the argument uh, that uh, drivers for Uber should be considered uh, workers and be entitled to holiday uh, and sick pay, as well as the issue now of Deliveroo, uh, delivery people, uh, and whether they're classified as self-employed or whether they're uh, workers. So this is very important. The problem is that simply the previous prescriptions haven't really been taken. It's very similar. I was on a panel recently with former finance ministers from Latin America, and all of us were wringing our hands about the informal sector. It's a bit like what Mark Twain said about the weather. We all talk about it, but no one does anything about it. Uh, so the question is, what is to be done beyond the standard prescriptions of formalizing these workers? My paper argues that what should be done is that the, uh, the international financial institutions of the G20 should look to create uh, a new social contract between states uh, and societies that cover this growing and very fragile and vulnerable working class that has persisted as a structural condition of uh, these economies for now over several decades. I want again, to take Isabel's comment. Uh, this is a historic opportunity, a moment of a lifetime, if you will, to be able to recreate uh, this attention uh, on this. What am I proposing? Well, as a short-term or medium-term, rather, proposal, the paper lays out what could be a, an option for expanding the possibility of individualized, flexible private insurance uh, for informal workers. This includes sort of pensions as well as uh, health insurance. There are similar models that are being undertaken in the Netherlands for gig economy workers and self-employed, similar models actually in China, in Kenya, and much of West Africa and Costa Rica. The argument that I'm laying out is to basically for the state to increase subsidies, to create these programs, to subsidize these insurance programs, um, and for uh, them to be sort of embedded in a regu regulated uh, private sector accounts that would be overseen by the private sector. Um, but the, the, the twist to all of this would come from the offer of debt relief, uh, notwithstanding David's, I think, very good analysis of the fact that we're not looking at a sovereign debt crisis uh, that many are worried about, there is obviously the question of fiscal space, the capacity of these governments to take on new social obligations. So the question here is, can the G20 and the IFIs begin to offer some form of debt relief either on, on the principal or on the service payments in exchange for the recreation or the creation or expansion of existing individualized social income, social insurance programs um, that would be voluntary, would have set minimum and maximum contributions, but could be portable uh, for individual workers to be able to carry from place to place and provide that essential social safety net. Um, the benefits of this would be not just uh, uh, economic, uh, with you know, 15 to 80% of the working class in many countries in the informal sector with what are estimated to be a very high cost of low productivity. This would bring benefits in terms of economic productivity, economic growth. But the second benefit is obviously political and social. These are uh, workers that are on the fringes of uh, the society and the fringes of the working class and have led to the large growth, not just in terms of domestic uh, inequality, but global inequality too, when you have rates of informal sector labor participation as high as 85% in Africa, 53% in Latin America. So that's primarily the proposal. Um, and, and as I say, also this could begin to address one of the structural uh, problems that has really bedeviled many of us who work on economics and development economics in particular, of growing global inequality. So I'll leave it there. Happy to answer any questions and thank you very much for your time. Chris, thank you very much. And I think it's an, one of several examples we have here. If we really mean something by Build Back Better, this is a really good area in which to start, um, one that's been neglected for a long period of time. Um, so thank you very much. And next I'd like to move um, for, to our, for our next paper to um, Lauga Poulsen, who's Associate Professor and Director of Graduate Studies at the School of Public uh, Policy at uh, UCL, and his paper is a joint one with Jeffrey Gertz, who's uh, a fellow uh, in the Economic and Development Program in the Brookings uh, Institution. So, Lauga, over to you. Thank you, Graham. Um, so, our paper is on Investor State Dispute Settlement, or ISDS, which is a mechanism that is enshrined in about 3,000 investment treaties around the world that allows multinationals to pursue international claims against sovereign governments. And it has, over the last 10, 15 years, right or wrong, uh, become 
one of the most controversial corners of international economic law. There was a question uh, I noted in the Q&A from Barbara Ritpath on, on Biden's proposal, uh, proposal to deal with um, what is largely seen as the overly generous regime on taxation for multinationals. Well, this is sort of your equivalent when it comes to uh, what at least some see as an overly generous property right regime for multinationals. Um, the OECD has um, in recent years been increasingly critical of the regime, has highlighted how in important ways, investment treaty arbitration or ISDS grants legal protections to foreign investors that go beyond those that are available to equivalent domestic investors in the UK, in Germany, France, Scandinavia, and so forth. The IMF's legal, uh, the, the, the lawyers in the IMF has also been critical of the regime for, for various reasons. We've seen criticisms emerging, uh, not just from international institutions, but also governments around the world. So for instance, a couple of years ago, uh, Pakistan, uh, in one of these claims, to those of you who are not familiar with the intricacies of ISDS, Pakistan was asked to pay $6 billion in compensation to a foreign investor for a mine that was never built. Um, uh, the investor had itself spent about $250 million on that project, but received $6 billion in compensation, which was equal to the entire IMF bailout given the same year to the Pakistani government. Now, as I said, uh, reasonable people disagree about the value, about the fairness of uh, this regime, but it has become undoubtedly a major political poison bill, in part because it is seen as a stumbling block for other areas of international economic cooperation. So for instance, we've seen a considerable number of claims against climate change measures, particularly in Europe, over the last couple of years, which is why the European Union wants to revisit the mechanism in the context of the Energy Charter Treaty, which allows for ISDS in the energy sector. We know from law firms that a range of claims are being considered against measures brought to respond to the pandemic over the last year. And um, we have increasing political uh, 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 mobilization across the world, not just in developing countries, but also developed countries to try and do something about this mechanism. President Biden has said he does not want this mechanism in future agreements. The EU is trying to do away with the mechanism, at least in its current form, in future agreements as well. We've seen criticism also from business groups, the German Association of Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises, were highly critical of the mechanism in the context of TTIP. German Association of Judges came out very critically against the mechanism as well. So we have mobilization from, from some business groups, surprisingly perhaps, but also from governments around the world. So what to do, right? So we have a lot of reform efforts going on uh, around the world. But what we note in the paper is that almost all of the discussions amongst policymakers um, is about future treaties how to deal with, with, with this mechanism in future agreements to negotiate better ISDS provisions and more carefully crafted investment treaties in the future. And that is a laudable objective. But the problem is that even with a better drafted treaty uh, uh, next year for a certain jurisdiction, you'll still have about 3,000 investment treaties in place that have been negotiated over the last couple of decades. So what do you do about them? Um, now, one option is for states to, to terminate, to, 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 to leave their agreements. And we've seen some states have begun to do that. India, Indonesia, South Africa, perhaps not too surprisingly, two weeks ago, Pakistan also said it wanted to terminate its investment treaties after the $6 billion war that came out in uh, 2019. But the problem with with leaving your treaties or unilaterally terminating the agreements is that that triggers so-called survival clauses, which means that the protections in the agreements remain in place sometimes for up to 20 years, allowing existing investors that are covered by the agreement to pursue similar claims decades into the future. Another model then instead of termination is then to renegotiate. And we've seen some renegotiations in recent years. So the NAFTA renegotiation uh, significantly limited ISDS and removed entirely going forward in, in the Canada-US investment relationship. 
but and that's again that's helpful uh, but I, but there's about 3000 these agreements in place and it's it's not feasible to renegotiate all of them um, so uh, the the challenge for for policymakers in this regime is that we're a bit stuck. Uh, there's general consensus that something has to something has to give, but it's not entirely clear how to do it. Now, our proposal um, is 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 a is, is a modest one, um, uh, but we think nevertheless a productive one. Uh, we suggest in our paper that uh, rather than renegotiating or terminating 3,000 treaties, um, states can come together and generate a plurilateral instrument, for instance, in the context of the OECD, telling arbitrators how to interpret those agreements. That is a legally uh, available option under international law that you can provide binding directions to tribunals on how to interpret often vague provisions in these agreements, it would be much more cost effective than parallel and serial renegotiations. And it will build on an emerging technical consensus amongst um, investment policymakers. We've worked, Jeff and I, and, and spoken with them for the last many years. And this is uh, very possible. It is a practical uh, way forward. It is feasible. What, what is needed uh, in order to make it work is for a couple of major economies to, to take the lead. And as for the relevant forum, what we suggest in the paper is that, again, if the United States is anyhow going to spend some time in Paris over the coming years talking about fixing preferential taxation for multinationals, well, perhaps they could also send their investment officials to the OECD to combine these efforts to also address multinationals' preferential legal rights as well. And if you want to see how that might work, then you can read the paper. Daga, thank you very much. And I think that's, you know, it's a good example of something that is clearly kind of doable. And, um, you know, we want by, by cooperating on this and having success in this, you know, it's something that may potentially contribute to the broader spirit of international economic cooperation. So I'm now uh, very pleased to uh, move to the sort of third uh, structural economic um, proposal, and that's from Simon Ebenet, uh, Professor of International Trade and Economic Development at the University of St. Gallen. And uh, uh, Simon, over to you. Thank you, Creon. Uh, my task is to identify the ways in which we can limit shortages of medical goods and to ensure the continuity of trade. I will just make four points. The first is uh, that the right way uh, to think about this problem is to think about how to limit the size and the duration of any shortages that might arise. And this, the shortages arise on the one part because there are demand surges, and those demand surges are influenced by public health policy choices of governments. We can work on trying to fix this supply chain, the supply side of this, but no number of fixes in this respect will uh, make up for first order mistakes that governments make on public health policy, which create the very demand shortages, demand shocks and shortages in the first place. And I think that's a very important point of context. And the paper deliberately talks about measures that governments can take on the public health policy side, as well as on the, on the supply side. The second point is that we discuss at length the, the issue of uh, diversification and whether or not more diversification should be encouraged. Uh, in looking carefully at the product level data, this is an issue which has probably been uh, over uh, exaggerated. There, where there are problems, uh, they're often in a specific number of uh, products. And here we need to have a very uh, sort of focused and targeted approach to encourage diversification across uh, different geographical locations. So it's not a, a matter of diversifying across suppliers, but also across locations. The third um, comment I would make uh, is that the paper discusses uh, national trade facilitation plans at, in times of pandemics and uh, potentially going forward. We can see um, that, of course, during pandemics, the demand for medical goods surges, and we want to encourage, therefore, the smooth importation of those goods. It may surprise many people to know that at the start of the pandemic, 141 nations were taxing the importation of soap, and 79 of them had import taxes at a rate of 15% or more. You cannot think of worse public policy 
uh, uh, that uh, uh, that existed at that time, and and governments, very many governments, sensibly got rid of those import tariffs. But what we need to have, I think, going forward, is a much more a forensic examination of all the barriers which uh, stop importation of uh, medical goods, both technical barriers as well as uh, non-tariff barriers as well. And the fourth um, final point I want to make is in the paper, we argue that nations shouldn't just be doing this alone, they should be cooperating and uh, forming or, or assigning a memorandum of understanding amongst like-minded nations, perhaps starting with the G7 and then working out from there. The goal should be to keep the trade routes open. It should be to lock in as much as possible these uh, national trade facilitation reforms I mentioned, and also to discourage the use of export controls. We saw last year export controls played havoc with the supply chains of uh, medical goods, and many countries quickly realized they were more counterproductive. Now that we've learned that, we should really be going forward uh, and uh, making sure that these are never used again. We also need to think uh, internationally about whether certain medical products and items can be stockpiled, whether there can be share uh, uh, swaps of those stockpiles when necessary. Another area for international cooperation is in the area of surveillance in terms of identifying uh, where uh, supply chains are coming under pressure, where there are shortages and the like. And of course, all of this won't happen unless there's a dedicated unit, probably in an international organization, which is devoted uh, to monitoring uh, these uh, critical supply chains in essential goods. And the paper draws that all together at the end with the framework and 10 principles for action. Thank you. Simon, that's brilliant. And thank you for being uh, so succinct. I mean, I think the yours, as with the others, but it's yours is a particularly good example of where you combine national measures with cooperation, you get a, a, a really good outcome. But if you have neither one nor the other, then um, you know we can be in real trouble. Um, but anyway, it's a, it's a good example of that. And I think one finds the same aspect with the other papers as well. Um, now, looking at the time, uh, what I've agreed with Robin is that we've got some really good questions coming in on the Q&A, but what he's going to do is pick those up in the, the panel session um, uh, in the second hour. So what it gives me the chance to do before Stephen does his uh, sort of final uh, segment is to ask a, uh, probably one or possibly two questions for all the authors. And the first question really is around um, the fact that, that all the papers in a way look at some of the most immediate issues that we're facing now and to some extent also longer term issues. One really important longer term issue that's coming down the tracks is, uh, is climate change and the response to climate change. And so policymakers have to face the challenge of integrating the response to, if you like, these immediate issues with um, the need to tackle climate change. And uh, this is, I think, now particularly acute for the, the sort of financial um, uh, and economic cooperation sphere. So I just wonder if anybody would like to sort of suggest, um, you know, how uh, policymakers should go about this challenge um, and whether, you know, it may be in some areas, there's a kind of win-win, um, but it's not true in every area. So what, what sort of, if you like, mind map should we have both tackling these immediate issues, but also taking on board uh, the challenge of uh, climate change, which is now um, coming at us very, very rapidly. So I don't know if anybody would like to um, put their hand up um, and respond to that. I can see Neil, you'll be very I'll say brave. two words. I'll say two yeah. words very, very, two, make two points very, very quickly in the interest of time, Creon. And if the first is I, I spoke at the start about how I thought that government's role should be reduced and contained to providing a platform for this transition to a post-pandemic economy. That was about investment in human capital and skills and also physical infrastructure. Clearly, green investment plays a huge part in, in that. Uh, and there's a, there's, there's a debate that we could, could stretch into days uh, that we could have a, around the priorities uh, and where that should focus. Um, but, but it's clear that kind of green investment plays a huge part in that in whatever form of public investment comes as in that program. The second point, and this links to the, the need for international coordination, is that I think tackling climate change is the ultimate collective action problem. You know, it's one thing saying there's going to be another three trillion of uh, investment in infrastructure in the US and it's going to be green focused, et cetera, et cetera. If China doesn't do the same and if India doesn't do the same and there's not a similar plan in Europe, 
then what's the point? Uh, that, so it, we're talking about the need for international co coordination and we're talking about the need for the IMF and the World Bank and other um, IFIs to find a role for themselves in, in the kind of post-pandemic economy. I think this is, this is a prime area actually, both coordinating policies, but also given that menu of options to, to, to governments, so this is where you get the most bang for your buck. Um, so, so I think, yeah, two points. There needs to be a big green element to the, to the fiscal plan, but also there's a, an obvious need for coordination and a clear role for IFIs to play in that. Thanks very much, um, Neil. Um, yeah, I think this is, this is very true. Um, and I just wonder, you know, if, if any of the, in the other areas, if there's any, uh, any comments that uh, authors would like to make on the, the sort of challenge of integrating their policy issue with the challenge of climate change. I mean, the question I have is, do people feel this is actually generally win-win um, and it's an opportunity or, or, or not? Isabel, yeah. Yeah, I would say, I would go beyond saying it's a win-win, it's climate change. It costs a lot to invest now to deal with it. It costs a lot more if you, if you don't make that investment now. And so it would be a very short-sighted approach to kind of say, well, I can't afford to make that investment now. Having said that, there is a problem. I mean, the US is about to <clears throat> throw $2 trillion at it. The EU has put together the uh, next generation EU fund. Again, I mean, a lot less money than the US, but still a lot. The emerging markets, as David has ex have explained, uh, there is a problem of where to find the where to find the money. And so, to me, this would really call on the the IFIs to come up with new ways of of helping these countries finance the investment into the the green transition, which has a social dimension to it as well, by the way, at much lower interest rates than they can obtain on the on the market. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, that I, I agree, and I think in a way, here's an opportunity. It's a bit like here's another building back better opportunity, uh, if if we you know have the political leadership to to take it. Um, very good. I mean, I I have one other question, which I will just very briefly put, which is a similar kind of question. So across the whole range of issues, there's a growing anxiety about the level of inequality within. Um, the global economy, both within countries and between countries. And many of the, the papers that uh, have been presented in a way are practical solutions that should help tackle the problem of inequality one way or another. Um, and uh, I think they go to the point that really there's no one single solution to inequality. It's actually a combination of many things uh, which if coordinated white will help us tackle this. But I wondered if if any uh, of the panelists would like to comment just briefly on how their issue relates to that broader question of inequality. I mean, particularly, maybe David, I could just ask you or Chris um, uh, in relation to the, to the, to the papers that you, you put forward. Chris, do you want to go? Perhaps? Sure, you had mentioned David first. While I was looking. Okay, so. No, that's okay. I'm happy to answer first. Um, the, um, I mean, that's fundamentally what this is. And, I, and again, I want to quote Isabel, who said, this is you know, once in a lifetime opportunity. It, it sounds like we're trying to sell something, we're not, but, but it is an opportunity to rethink the nature of uh, new uh, labor markets and how they've evolved over the last 20, 30, 40 years uh, and what can be done. Uh, it is, these are not, and, and this is not something to, to sort of lay the blame at, at structural adjustment packages of the past or the Washington consensus. The, the poorly labeled uh, economic reform plan that the IMF, it, it also has to do with the fact that labor unions for a long time simply didn't engage in the sort of advocacy around these sorts of workers because they just couldn't, they didn't quite fit into their own model. And so and this is a larger organizational uh, transformation that needs to take place that addresses the needs of, of an emerging and, and large working class that simply hasn't had uh, that level of economic security. And so you're looking at this not just in terms of inequality, but you're looking at the, the political effects of this in places where you know, just statistically, I know in, in Latin America, for example, those who are most likely to, to vote for more populist options, uh, whether for president or the like, tend to be those who uh, work in the informal class. So it also has a political implication. So I think this very much goes to the heart of inequality. Uh, and, and I think it's, it, we need to understand the nature of that inequality more than just 
increasing uh, living standards above a certain threshold, which is the way it was measured before. Thanks very much. David, any very quick? Just one, one quick yeah. point. The, the long end of the South African yield curve embeds a real interest rate, which is in excess of 6%. South Africa's potential growth rate is probably no more than 1.5%. If GDP-linked bonds offer a way of uh, allowing interest rates to come down because the buyers of the bonds have the equity upside that's related to more rapid, you know, related to more rapid growth, should more rapid growth uh, occur, then I, I can see that that is, that fits very, very neatly into issues to do with uh, income inequality. Um, and also uh, fits very neatly into the kind of political requirements of what it takes to make uh, debt sustainable, because, uh, you know, there is a, a reasonable growing political risk associated with the idea that a bunch of uh, a bunch of rentiers are receiving interest rates that are four times the potential growth rate of the economy. Phil, you need to unmute. That's, uh, I've got it. Thank you very much, David. Sorry. Uh, not doing very well with the technology. Great. Well, thank you very much to all the authors for their presentations and their succinctness. Now I'd like to pass to my, my co-author, Stephen, um, who will uh, sort of set out some of the, the ideas that he and I have been thinking about in relation to modalities um, and priorities for corporations. So Stephen, over to you. Okay, thanks very much indeed, Creon, and thanks to all the authors who have um, uh, uh, put put their efforts together to, to come up with ideas for uh, ways in which uh, international cooperation can can make uh, can help us to recover better from uh, this this crisis. Um, I want to talk briefly um, about the how how you might. Uh, uh, achieve some of these uh, uh, these these changes, and I've put together a small a, a short slide screen because uh, you haven't been able to look, look at our paper yet. Um, but uh, first of all, uh, very quickly, why why bother with international cooperation? Um, there are the standard arguments about uh, involving spillover effects. Uh, there are some problems that can only be addressed uh, by international cooperation uh, and the way in which poorer countries can uh, can be brought up um, also requires uh, full international cooperation. So you can envisage a situation where international cooperation allows all countries to manage their way out of the, uh, the pandemic better. Um, but we think that it's also important to uh, recognize that um, you need to have a way of rebuilding international trust and, uh, and the institutions that you will need uh, going forward to, uh, to tackle the longer term global challenges that we've started to touch on. I mean, there has been a lot going on uh, in the crisis. I think it's important to recognize that. Uh, a lot of them have been national responses. There's been unprecedented fiscal support, uh, unprecedented monetary uh, mechanisms to, to support uh, banking systems and so on, uh, job support mechanisms. Part of the downside though is of these national responses is uh, some of the measures which have had uh, consequences, international consequences, usually bad consequences. Um, so you, you've had travel restrictions which have uh, prevented uh, some of the, some industries, travel, labor movements. You've had uh, a degree of vaccine uh, nationalism, um, which, which have been unhelpful. Um, the, the flip side of that is that there have been some really positive international responses so far. The central bank started out by putting in place swap lines uh, to ease international liquidity. 
you've had, as as people have referred to already, the debt sustain the debt service um, uh, mechanism put in place by the G20. Uh, the SDR allocation looks hope hopefully to be uh, on its way which will help uh, to ease international liquidity, but also potentially support poor countries. And uh, the likes of COVAX uh, uh, has enabled um, vaccine access to uh, more broadly uh, uh, in the global community. Um, as I said, the authors have, have come up with some very good ideas about uh, priorities for uh, using international coordination uh, to address. Um, I, I think it's helpful to think in terms of uh, groupings of urgent, high payback, quick wins and longer term challenges. Uh, some of the urgent priorities, I think, are uh, to make sure that we have some agreement on how uh, countries are going to exit from their support measures. Um, and Neil uh, has, has addressed that. Um, I think uh, the way in which you can uh, free up trade in medical supplies, as Simon has outlined, uh, is, is also an urgent issue. Then you've got some issues which have you give you a very high payback if you can if you can manage to uh, address them. Uh, and, and there are two examples which have been discussed so far. One is how you uh, head off any incipient debt crises. So uh, David and uh, Isabel have addressed those. Um, how you avoid a future financial crisis. Uh, uh, and Rebecca and Till uh, uh, have looked at that. Quick wins are obviously uh, usually very attractive to uh, to things like the spring meetings and G20 meetings, uh, which is why it's encouraging to see that um, uh, the SDR allocation looks to be on track uh, for being introduced fairly quickly. Uh, also, the, uh, the, the US uh, approach to corporate taxation um, looks to be something where uh, a lot of the spade work, a lot of the groundwork has been done. Putting these in place quickly uh, should not be uh, should not uh, be beyond the wit of uh, of, um, of uh, governments. Um, but I think uh, I think Lauga and Jeff have a very interesting uh, uh, take on it as well, where addressing uh, the, the shortcomings of investment treaties could be a really useful uh, way forward. That is, but that leaves the, the longer term challenges still to be addressed. Uh, the issues of uh, planning, planning for a future pandemic, climate change, inequality, which we've just been discussing. And I think those are more difficult, but it doesn't mean to say they should not be addressed uh, start to be addressed um, immediately. There are clear limits to uh, the way in which international cooperation and coordination can work. There are clearly a whole range of domestic constraints. Politics gets in the way of many of these uh, efforts, but there are also geopolitical constraints. Um, the, the sorts of geopolitical tensions that we're seeing between the West, for example, and China uh, is not going to make life any easier to get international cooperation going. Uh, the sort of vaccine nationalism uh, which we've seen in Europe um, also uh, stems from some of those geopolitical constraints. But it's not all bad news because uh, I think, as, as uh, Creon said at the start, when this was first mooted, um, we were. This was after four years of an American administration, which was um, pushing America first. That is on the way. Thank. Um, so the the climate there is a little bit more conducive to uh, launching international cooperation measures. 
There are clearly also technical constraints. Uh, you need to have the IFIs involved, um, but you need the, nation, the nations that are the members of the IFIs to, uh, to come in and support them. And you need to address some of the shortcomings uh, which the IFIs themselves face. Um, we're not going to go into that in detail because uh, that is a long, uh, a long subject, which, for example, the, the Tarman report looked at a couple of years ago, it concluded, as you can see from this quote, that the, uh, that the whole system uh, lacked coherence and capacity. Um, but nevertheless, it's an issue that would, it would help if we could address that. Steve, so um, sorry, sorry to come in, but I, I think um, maybe what we could do is just um, quick, quickly Fine. do the last slide and then we'll move to the, to the next session. It's really my fault, I'm afraid. But... Go, for, go for it. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much, um, everyone. Um, as I say, it was my fault for running over um, there, but I think we had a really good range of um, uh, presentations, an enormous amount of material. And what I'd like to do now is uh, to hand over to Robin for the, for the next part of the panel. Um, we were planning to have a short break, but I think um, what we'll do is uh, move to the next part of the panel straight away and um, People will be able to take the break during the during the during the discussion if they need to. Thank you, Robin. Over to you. Well, thanks, Creon, and I'm I'm sorry we didn't get um, to see uh, Stephen's last slide, but I'm sure I'll give him a chance of of uh, final refusal um, at the end uh, if he needs to come in again. Uh, I would uh, just like to invite our final set of panelists to uh, open up their videos. Um, with uh, Philip Hammond, Jan Julius, and uh, Raghu Rajan. Um, delighted that they can join us. They've had the benefit of having seen some of these papers um, in advance of their being uh, uh, um, released uh, as we've gone through the process. Um, uh, Jan Julius um, was chair of Chatham House. Actually, was director of the uh, International Economics Programme, as it was called uh, a little while ago. So knows Chatham House's work very well as a senior advisor and a distinguished fellow in the Global Economy and Finance Programme now, and I think known to all of you from her role on a number of boards and chief economist at Shell and BA in its uh, day uh, and on the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England, et cetera. Um, Philip Hammond, um, I, one of those people I'm able to say needs no introduction, but that won't stop me from saying a couple of words of introduction. Uh, delighted that Philip is also now on the panel senior advisors uh, of uh, Chatham House, but obviously, Chancellor of the Exchequer um, in that uh, period after 2016, uh, where he had to deal with a lot of these topics. So probably I'm sure very grateful that he still is in Chancellor during COVID-19. Um, but having served prior to that uh, as Foreign Secretary, Defence Secretary, and a number of other cabinet uh, and other roles between 2010 and 19. And delighted to have uh, Professor Raghu Rajan uh, with us here today. Raghu, thank you very much for joining us from University of Chicago Booth School, where he is a distinguished service um, professor of finance uh, at the Booth School there. Obviously known to everyone here for his writing. Uh, most recent book, The Third Pillar, which I think is particularly appropriate actually for all we're discussing today, the disconnects um, between market, state, and the community, The Third Pillar. And Raghu, I definitely want to get your angle as to how that book you wrote sits inside uh, uh, this crisis of COVID-19. Uh, when we come to you, but having served also as Governor of the Reserve Bank of India from 2013 to 16, perhaps uh, Raghu also will be able to give us some real picture and, uh, on some of the dynamics that we've discussed here, inequalities um, and uh, uh, informal economies and how some of the emerging markets are coping with this terrible crisis, uh, also having served as Vice Chair of the Bank of International Settlements and Chief Economist the IMF amongst his other roles. So a great group. Uh, to be able to look at our issues. Um, Philip, I'm going to run kind of in the order on the, on the agenda. I'm going to start with you, um, but maybe just a nice soft opening question, if I could put it that way. Um, is there something that really stood out to you on this list? Uh, and I thought actually the way Stephen pulled it out into the urgent, you know, the long term, the quick wins, etc. Is there something that stood out to you before? This is a great idea. If I'd been 
uh, Charles Exchequer, that's what I'd be championing right now in the G20 or, or the IMF or wherever. Um, and something maybe that's missing, an issue that you really want to put on the agenda from your perspective. Let me turn to you first. Robin, I mean, there's, there's a whole raft of good ideas in these papers. It's, it's um, uh, a feast um, and, and, and uh, you know, the risk is of indigestion. I think actually just listening to the presentation there, the overwhelming impression I had was of being a politician or at least a former politician in a room full of economists. And there are many, many proposals here, which I perfectly well understand, and they make perfect sense looking at the world uh, from an economist's perspective. But I'm immediately seeing significant political pitfalls around um, many of them. For, for, for example, um, the, the expression build back better, which of course our own prime minister here in the UK um, uses. Um, and the, the, the real sense that I got from so many of the contributors that they see this as a real opportunity, a real sort of sense of positivity about the whole thing. I am not convinced that our electorate uh, is necessarily viewing the next couple of years in that way. I think um, if you took a poll, you'd find that what most people want to do is get back as near as possible to how things were in February uh, 2020. So there's going to be a real challenge between sort of visionary um, global um, uh, uh, viewpoint of um, of, of, of um, people thinking like the panel here, and uh, an electorate that is just weary um, of this intervention. But if you ask me for what stood out for me, the thing that has troubled me since the very beginning of this crisis has been around global supply chains. The, the, um, the shock of realizing just how fragile our 21st century world is, particularly in a, a, a developed economy where you take so much uh, for granted, um, realizing just how crude um, uh, the world is, and you know, um, little things that stick in my mind, like um, seeing civilized, developed countries seizing and impounding shipments of uh, uh, of goods that they happen to think they rather like, um, in the way that you would probably not have associated with um, advanced uh, um, economies, and um, I think it's that. Um, uh, that sense of the fragil fragility of um, globalization. Um, and um, for me, the bit that we perhaps need to, to look at a bit more and reinforce here is the risk that in any crisis, there's always a default to the nation state. Um, that will disappoint many people. It certainly disappoints the leadership of the EU um, that you know, when COVID struck, uh, people across Europe weren't saying, what is Brussels going to do about this? They were saying, what is Rome? What is Paris? What is Berlin going to do about this? Um, and um, this fragile, globalised world that was already under tremendous pressure, um, not least by the disengagement between China and the US, COVID has given a kind of quasi-respectability to some of these trends away from globalisation. I think if we're not if we're not very careful, we're going to allow globalization, we, we run the risk that COVID will become the veneer of respectability for what is little more than outright protectionism. I already smell a bit of it around talking about, you know, in, in my own part of the forest in Europe, um, you know, developing uh, European champions in this, that, and the, the other. Um, whenever I hear the word champion, I always, um, uh, become extremely nervous extremely quickly. Thank you very much, Philip. Just, uh, yeah, um, I was noticing that in Stephen's presentation, he talked about one of the good bits of news is that we've moved away from a president who talks about America first. But um, I do hear a lot of talk about made in America. Um, and of course, it's not necessarily America first, but there is a made in America dimension, which I think is an echo, as you said, uh, of the political imperatives uh, so many other face. Just to I take advantage, we had so many good questions in the chat, I'm, I'm worried we won't get to them all in the Q&A. Um, but to pick up on your theme about this split between the sort of build back better, and so many people just wanted to get back to where they were before. Where do you sit on this issue that James Blinder raised in his question about um, the costs of going green? 
um, and uh, debt levels. Um, a lot of the talk is that going, you know, going green is actually part of an answer to uh, maybe create jobs, um, to see it as an opportunity. Do you see the climate agenda getting squeezed by this with your politician's hat on? Or can that be one of the areas where you really do leverage the opportunity for the future? So let me um, preface my comment by saying that I personally am committed to uh, the green agenda. I think it's something we have to do. We don't have an alternative. But I do worry that in certainly in the UK, but I think uh, across the developed world, politicians are being disingenuous in the way they present uh, this challenge to electorates. Um, yes, of course, uh, a green economy will create jobs. Um, there's, no, there's no issue about that. But we are making a choice here. We're making a choice um, over the next couple of decades, three decades, to invest hugely in uh, one area of our economy, trans the, the energy transition. And what we're doing effectively is deciding that instead of increasing the quantity of people's uh, consumption, we will increase the quality of it by decarbonizing it. And we're inviting people to see that although, they're, although their pot may not be getting bigger, um, it is getting significantly better. I think we've got quite a long way to go to persuade people, particularly those living um, uh, further down the prosperity uh, curve of that argument. And I'm, I'm um, looking forward to seeing how politicians in developed countries um, sell this argument. Uh, for politicians in developing countries, frankly, I find it um, challenging um, to see how they are even going to persuade themselves to want to do that. Um, if I'm an Indian politician, uh, I take India at random, um, uh, you know, availability of energy, uh, of electricity, is a far more electorally alluring prospect than the composition of the generation mix, I would guess. Uh, Raghu will perhaps be able to comment uh, with more authority than me, but I find it difficult to see that Indian politicians will, will anytime soon sacrifice um, growth in energy supply for improvement in the green credentials of um, energy supply. But I, I absolutely agree that, that there's a role for the IFIs. There has to be a role for the IFIs in the green transition because, um, as somebody said earlier on, unless we coordinate this, um, we're, we're frankly, it's not that we're wasting our time, but that it's going to be politically impossible to sell um, if it looks as though um, a, you know, a, a, a national government is inflicting um, the, the high degree of challenge on its own population um, when others are not doing um, their share. But I absolutely agree with Tarman, um, who was quoted earlier, that if the IFIs are gonna step up to that role, there's quite a lot of structural change needs to take place around them. Thanks, Philip. Thanks very much for those comments. Um, I feel we'll be able to come back to you, uh, maybe with some questions or comments from the uh, paper writers. Let me turn to, to Deanne. Um, Deanne, maybe same up the question. Did, did something in particular stand out to you from that set of presentations? And, and what do you think was, was missing or something you'd like to, to sort of put on the agenda in addition? Start with that. Over yeah. to you. Well, thanks, Robin. I mean, I, I think I'd really start by just congratulating all of the authors and, and Creon for pulling this all together, because it uh, it is a group of really interesting papers with some quite meaty suggestions. Uh, yeah, it's tricky to pick one. I, I, suppose, um, I suppose for me, since I worked on foreign direct investment in my earlier lives uh, and published a bit on it, I, I found the the best idea, really, the paper on uh, looking at the existing uh, bilateral investment treaties and coming up with these interpretive statements to try to actually defuse some of the bombshells that are that are in existing treaties. Uh, that is probably of no interest at all to the political uh, classes. I, th I thought Philip's point was very interesting that economists might look at these things quite different than politicians. Uh, I suppose if, uh, if I were to, to perhaps think about it in those terms, uh, 
something that wasn't really discussed uh, very much was the the issue of the green agenda and whether there are elements um, that could be part of a solution to some of these issues. And there, putting back my aspirational economic hat on again, uh, I think an, er an area that would be quite helpful coming out of COP26, if, if we ever get there, would be um, a notional co global carbon tax. Uh, notional meaning it, I, that not too many countries would actually impose the tax, but for making public investment decisions, for making corporate investment decisions, to actually use a carbon tax, which is consistent, a notional tax, a notional cost of, of generating carbon, uh, that is consistent with reaching the, uh, the zero carbon uh, goal in 2020. And at the moment that, uh, at least from some studies that I've seen, that looks like it would be about $100 per, CO, per, per ton of CO2 by 2030, going up to something like $350 per ton uh, in today's dollars um, by 2050. That, that's the kind of coordination for that I think could make a big difference uh, because simply because the, the, the carbon, um, the climate ch change issue is you know, the preeminent area that needs global cooperation. Uh, I, I suppose a smaller thing just to throw it in as well would be Biden's tax plan, his corporate tax plan. Now, of course, that's only come out recently, but those of us who've been following the OECD work on that, I uh, think that that's an area where I suspect um, the average voter understands what's going on, or, and uh, there might well be a, a convergence of both economic and, and political support for reform of corporate taxation. As it's, you mentioned, that was gonna be actually one of my follow-up questions to you, because Barbara Ridpath put that uh, in the Q&A. Mm -hmm list there, you know, where do you think the Biden proposal for minimum global corporate tax sat in there? And I think your, your point being is there is uh, at least some uh, indication of, of an openness on the US side. We'll see if it can be pushed through the US political process for coordination on this front. Um, and that would then provide perhaps a framework for your uh, idea about really thinking about this idea of a notional carbon tax. I think unpacking that word notional sounds like a very important part of the, of the mix, which maybe is a challenge for us a Chatham House to take up, actually. So my, let me pose a different follow-up question uh, to you, um, which really, I suppose, pulls out from, from the papers that we saw there, in particular Rebecca's paper. I mean, how do you think that the steps that were taken, especially through the framework of the Bank for International Settlements in the wake of the global financial crisis, how have those, uh, do you think they've stood the test of time? Have they meant that we went into this crisis in a more resilient way? and the proposals that were put forward in that paper about we may need to then think about whether these now need to be adapted going forward from there. So how did, how did you think about this business of, of the kind of regulatory framework in which we've put the financial institutions and the banks uh, through this, this process, or through this uh, crisis? Well, one of the things that really struck me reading uh, that paper, but also some of the others was actually um, how well the lessons from the global financial crisis served us going into this crisis. You know, it, it is interesting that uh, it was possible to prevent the health crisis turning into a financial crisis in the, in the very early stages uh, with the excess liquidity. Uh, the, I mean, Neil's paper talks about the very large amount of fiscal support that governments came up with this time. It, it was, uh, it was this, uh, what's it called, go big, go fast. Uh, it, we, we did learn lessons from that crisis, which served us well. And the regulatory changes that were made uh, did mean that banks went into this crisis in a much more healthy position from the point of view of their, their buffers and their reserves than, than we had before. So I think, you know, in a way, um, policymakers deserve a bit of a pat on the back uh, in what they did with the previous crisis. Uh, that's not to say that more doesn't need to be done, but I think that um, the idea of having a proper review of how uh, banking regulation, financial regulation and monetary policy um, contributed to this would be useful both to learn its lessons, but also one of the big challenges we face after all is unwinding some of this very, very large stimulus that is now uh, still coursing through our economies. And although I agree with Neil that you have to be careful not to unwind it too soon, I think also there are some major risks in leaving it in, in there too long. Uh, 
So um, especially with QE, I think we have some lessons that we could learn about unwinding it. Thanks, dear. Well, that actually is a perfect transition uh, to, to Raghu. Again, I'll kick off that big opening question about what stood out and uh, what do you think wasn't addressed. I can't resist praising that question with a reference to the article you had in the FT, I think it was about a week or so ago, a riot of US spending spells trouble for future generations. So, I mean, you know, you unpacked it. Uh, maybe that wasn't even your title. That might have been the newspaper's title. But uh, Raghu, why don't you come in and, and maybe address those those points and, and maybe give us a little hint as to whether you're a little more worried <laughs> to pick up where well, Deanne left off. Over to you. Let, let, let me get there. I, I, I first want to commend the papers. Uh, there's a lot of thinking outside the box. Sometimes out of the box thoughts are entirely new. Sometimes they have been around, but dismissed for various reasons, real or perceived. And sometimes they go against important vested interests. So it's important to bring them up again to see if the environment has changed, whether they actually make more sense given the realities of the moment. So uh, one example of this, I mean, coming to one of the ideas I, I really liked was GDP linked bonds. But, you know, they've been around, the idea has been around for a long time, as David would agree. And yet very few countries have tried them. Uh, Argentina tried a version, and he, he mentions that, but, uh, you know, they fudged their GDP numbers, and so it wasn't particularly effective. But why don't, I mean, uh, there are versions of this commodity-linked bonds. Why doesn't an oil-producing country link its uh, debt to oil prices? That's harder to fudge. But still, countries don't do that. Uh, I think Augustin Karstens is the only finance minister who tried intervening in oil and actually made money for his country, got some praise for it, but he's the only one. And I think some of it has to do with the risk return trade of finance ministers. If you actually make money, uh, you know, very few people recognize that. But if you lose a lot of money, you're the guy who went out into this crazy new instrument and, uh, and invested in it. And, uh, and uh, maybe there was a payoff uh, and uh, which was under the table. So, I mean, it's very hard. We tried. I was at the World Bank uh, doing a project. We tried getting countries to be interested in this. They simply don't buy it. So uh, I, I hope the time is ripe. Uh, I think David has the right idea. Let's first run it through more advanced countries and then see if it hits elsewhere. I think commodity link would be easier than GDP linked, but let's 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 explore that. That that makes sense. Now, to your point, I mean, I, I do think we are in a really uncommon, in fact, unprecedented environment. So it's hard to draw lessons from the past. Um, you know, clearly the pandemic shock is different from the normal recession. Uh, it's tragic, but it also has some elements which uh, could imply a faster recovery and also some pent up demand. Uh, and also we've had this unprecedented monetary and fiscal support. I mean, the US is spending, as Larry Summers says, like wartime, 30% of GDP over the, last, uh, over the last year and this year uh, for something which in magnitude terms is far smaller. Uh, we, uh, you know, we, we would see uh, the pandemic's effects everywhere except in the prospective GDP numbers. I mean, six and a half percent growth is, is stunning. And uh, we, what happened to the pandemic? Um, and, and I think we have to adjust for that in, in some of our review. I mean, I, I, I think it's OK to say the financial system is doing fine. But if the intent was the financial system should do fine without public support, then clearly uh, that's not true. Uh, right from the Fed intervention in March to the massive uh, income adjustments in the U.S. based on uh, transfers from the uh, from the fiscal system, uh, I mean there has been enormous support, and so I, I don't think it's. We can, uh, without detailed analysis, say that Basel worked. I mean, I would love for it to have worked because I worked on Basel, but but I think we need to be careful because uh, 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 we've had moratoria, we've had fiscal supports. Uh, you know, uh, there is uh, some risk still in the system uh, as these supports come to an end. We have to see what happens then, but I do think uh, we have to adjust for that. The third thing I'll say and end there is that it is dangerous, and I want to get 
back to something Lord Hammond said in a second, it is dangerous to push prescriptions that are driven by industrial country priorities and leverage. I think we saw that in one of the papers with ISDS, that was a prior priority for some countries at some points, and we are seeing the consequences. TRIPS was a trade, uh, um, I forget the acronym, the protection of intellectual properties pushed by uh, American pharmaceutical companies. And some countries are seeing that it uh, overly restricts their ability uh, to enter some areas. But I, I think the problem more is that these priorities shift. We've just talked about a tremendous shift in priorities between the Trump administration and the Biden administration. So uh, if, and it's quite possible it shifts again, if Congress shifts, if uh, we get a new administration, which is not democratic, uh, you know, uh, priorities could shift again. To have those priorities imposed on the rest of the world is, is, is very dangerous. I mean, for sure, it subverts the democratic process. And this is why I want to hesitate a little bit when I see proposals like, let us propose debt relief for X. I mean, debt relief is a form of leverage. I think uh, for certain, you want to make sure it's used in a reasonable way. It doesn't go straight to somebody's Swiss bank account. But you do want to allow for the democratic process in the country to actually assert itself. Uh, for example, asking Belize to take action on climate change in return for debt relief. That may not be their priority. They may have other priorities. Are you, in a sense, burdening the recovery process with the demands that would not be uh, undertaken in your own country? And furthermore, are you undermining uh, any democratic prospect for, you know, uh, support for uh, climate change actions by insisting on them as an outside uh, requirement. Um, so uh, I, I think you may be skeptical about the governance in some areas, but it's dangerous to substitute your own sense of what is appropriate governance. And that often comes back to hurt us. Uh, let me end, uh, and I'll be very quick on this, uh, you know, um, Lord Hammond mentioned the default nation state and as a way of strengthening the power of the nation state versus, say, Europe. I would uh, say the same thing, but in the other direction, strengthening the, uh, the position of the national capital versus more decentralized entities in the country. We are defaulting again to that in the pandemic, and sometimes it is the right thing to do, but it does create enormous, uh, enormous power in that. In that. Uh, let You just muted yourself, Raghu, but I'm just kidding. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay, carry on. Yep. Uh, you're, you're unmuted I, I again. Would, That's good. Yep. I was going to say, I have a comment on the global tax. I think it's a great idea. I have a twist on it, but I'll wait for discussion. <laughs> Thank, thanks very much. Just one very quick uh, follow-up as, as I've, I've got you here. And I, I'm glad you mentioned that business about we seem to be defaulting back to the capitals versus, let's call it, more decentralized governance, because it does strike me that when you look at the kind of proposal that's coming out of Washington right now, it is about retesting the idea of the role of the state and the state often being the central state in the context of growth generation. And a lot of people are saying, hooray, you know, uh, this is where we needed to be. There's many other people who are saying, well, hold on a minute. Um, some because they favor the market, but I think I heard you say because they favor something that's neither the market nor the central state. It's more about the bottom up drivers of growth. But Maybe that's a thing we could, could come to later on. But I, I didn't want to pass up the opportunity here because Philip mentioned India and its example, such a huge economy. But when I look at Chris Sabatini's paper and the way that the COVID crisis has exposed the vulnerability and the centrality of informal workers in the functioning of particular economies, India is... Will you tell me, I think is a, is a test case or, or of that particular reality. The fact that those workers were, in essence, chucked out, as far as I can tell, a little bit onto the pavement, literally, uh, at the beginning of the process. What did you think when you read that paper, if you saw that paper, or, or at least the comments Chris made, do you think there is something really systemic about the role of informal workers in many developing or emerging economies markets and how they have to be included or blended into uh, sustainable growth going forward? Uh, absolutely. I, I, I think it's an important point. But I, I would say that that doesn't seem to me the obvious starting point. I mean, they are often, as we've seen with the migrant workers, uh, you know, those horrible pictures of people on the road 
transporting their kids on their shoulder, uh, there is very little social protection. But there is very little social protection even for formal workers. And, and so I would start by uh, first ensuring that there is, uh, you know, in India, we have a rural employment guarantee program, which allows for rural unemployed workers to get some support. That's, that's been quite effective. We don't have anything in urban areas. So you could be a formal urban worker with limited unemployment insurance, in fact, none, and you could be fired and you could be, uh, I mean, they're virtually uh, informal. And what the government has been trying to its credit is to first try and build protections for those. Uh, it also has to build protections for the informal, but the assumption, and this is why you see the migration, is they will go back to the villages where there is this rural support and they will be able to take advantage of that. I, I don't think uh, that's that's right, but, but I would say the starting point is improve protections with those who are easiest to reach and, and strengthen, then con focus on an urban uh, guarantee program. Uh, Jean Drez has, has an idea, others have ideas. This will come, but, but uh, uh, so uh, put differently, when you look at these workers in, in industrial countries, these are the least protected, but everybody else is protected. So this seems like the right place to start. Uh, there may be easier places to start elsewhere. Thanks very much. Look, what I'm going to do, I'm keeping an eye on time. We're, we're getting lost on the table. What I'd like to do is maybe invite some of the paper writers who put so much effort into their papers to almost, if I can say, ask a question back to our panel or bring one of their points back to the panel. And as we had to cut Stephen off before slide seven, which I'm sure had all of his key conclusions in it, but rather than, than sharing the conclusion, Stephen, which we'll see in your final paper, did, did you want to kind of throw a question back to... Uh, some combination of, of Philip Vian and, and Raghu. Let me throw it to you. And then, uh, David, I thought I might bring you in on the issue of, of the bombs. And in any case, I, I kind of catch my eye or, or um, put a note into the chat for me and I can draw on some of you, the, the authors first. Stephen, you, you're first on my list. Uh, lovely, thank you very much, Robin. Uh, and thanks very much indeed to uh, Philip, Raghu and Diane. Um, I. There's a, there's a really big central question underlying uh, what, uh, what I heard from you, uh, and that is how you reconcile the domestic political with the need to get to tackle uh, either issues that can be better uh, addressed internationally or cannot be addressed unless they are uh, internationally agreed. So um, I, 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 I guess I, to, to specify the question, um, if you want to uh, make progress on something that uh, you really need to, uh, to um, push forward through the G20, for example, or the IMF, um, and you need to build the political support in your own domestic constituency uh, for something that may seem very remote and uh, not, not at all relevant to your, your domestic electorate. Um, what is, what is, are there particular things you can do? Is you, are there ways in which you can uh, bring those issues back to a domestic level to emphasize why um, support for an internationally agreed program uh, is important. Do you want to, Philip, do you want to just as a first write a reply and you can pick up on any other points yeah. you heard as well from Diane and, and, and Raghu and then I'll, I'm going to bring in uh, uh, maybe a couple of the other report authors if they want to catch my eye. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the role, and I was going to say something about the G20 um, anyway, particularly the G20, because um, somebody said earlier on that the, the, the recent output from the G20 had been a little bit disappointing in terms of coordination of fiscal policy. Um, I do know from experience that as soon as the words coordinating fiscal policy are uttered, quite a serious number of people around the table, um, you know, close down their participation. Um, Many of our G20 colleagues see the G20 as a place where things that are properly done at international level should be agreed, but mostly they would not agree 
that fiscal policy was something that should be um, decided uh, at, at G20 level and for, for all sorts of reasons, including political, but also for um, economic reasons, uh, they, they would wish to retain their um, freedom of maneuver in um, uh, fiscal uh, policy. Um, but I think the, the role of, a, of, of, the, of the finance minister, if you like, or the, the national leader sitting in the G20 forum is essentially that of a broker. And, and this, this will be exactly the same, whether it's a developed economy or an emerging market. Um, the gap between um, my understanding, let, let, let me, you know, the gap between my understanding as a G20 finance minister of a proposition and its value to the world and the Indonesian finance minister's understanding of that proposition will probably be quite small because we were educated in the same way. We think along the same lines, you know, to, be, to put it bluntly, we are part of a global um, elite, but we will both have very different challenges in trying to sell that proposition to our domestic electorates. So we go away from those meetings having all congratulated each other on the good things we're proposing to do, thinking in the plane on the way home, how the hell am I going to sell this to my political colleagues and ultimately um, uh, to, uh, to my electorate? Um, the, the, the international, the minimum taxation, um, taxation of digital companies agenda is an area where superficially, as um, somebody said earlier, there is a convergence between what is economically sensible and what is politically sellable, um, because there's pretty much universal demand for something to be done about this. But I have a persistent fear, and I'm, you know, I'd, I'd be delighted to be proved wrong, but I'm afraid that I think that um, consumers and taxpayers in developed economies are going to be disappointed to the point of anger when they discover actually how much tax um, their exchequers, their treasuries are going to benefit um, by. I mean, I know from some, some polling that we did in the UK when we introduced our digital tax, which we estimated would raise about 400 million pounds a year, um, that we had a whole lot of electors out there who thought that if Amazon paid proper taxes, they wouldn't need to pay any income tax at all. A, a completely distorted understanding of what the proposition was. And, uh, it, you know, I'm afraid over the last 18 months, two years, in trying to move this agenda forward, some politicians have not helped that problem by, by talking up. Some of my European, uh, former European political colleagues are digging themselves big holes by talking up um, the benefits that will come from getting this agenda delivered. It will now be delivered. I'm confident about that. But the consequences will be far, far smaller. Than many of our voters are expecting. Very important points. Thank you. Look, I'm just keeping an eye on time. I'm just going to try and see if we can unmute a couple of our people who've got good questions, maybe get two or three of them on, on the table. Um, uh, Andre Hoffman's got a very interesting question about a sovereign debt instrument. Andre, are you there? And if you are, can uh, Sam, you? Yes, I can see Andre on my little screen. If you could unmute yourself, Andre, we should be able to get you to ask your question. Uh, or Sam can unmute you. Can somebody unmute Andre? Yes, great. Go ahead, Andre. Well, <clears throat> uh, you take me by surprise. I wasn't really uh, expecting to have the limelight. This is very embarrassing. Very, You've got very, it. Very nice to see you all. Now, uh, um, we were talking about uh, uh, foreign debt and we were talking about the, 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 the ways we can link some of the benefits that um, uh, developing countries can bring to the conversation about um, uh, about conservation and about nature resources and about uh, uh, biodiversity uh, uh, and how we could link this with the existing burden of the debt. If um, we provide the, the, the opportunity to countries to deforest in order to pay back the principles, we are not uh, helping ourselves. So the idea is really to uh, demonstrate a certain link between ecosystem uh, preservation and perhaps even ecosystem restoration and regeneration in exchange of uh, a different attitudes towards the debt repayment. So the G20 have just met. There's, there've been there've been some uh, some some uh, 
lightening of the load, but there's nothing structural in place. And I think there needs to be some sort of mechanism to create short-term liquidity to allow to address the equipment issues, the, the infrastructure issues that are on the table. And I would be quite interested to hear what um, the, the, the panel has to, to say about this. I, I'm really trying to posit this short-term need for cash with the long-term reimbursement of the debt, which frankly could be paid not with, 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 with money, but with nature. That's the idea. Very interesting proposal. So, if, folks, if you can hold that thought, and I'll invite our um, our panelists to come back on it, but also some of our paper authors, if any of them have a particular idea. I'm going to try and get a couple of other questions onto the table as well. Um, Bill Campbell, I think, asked about six questions. So, Bill, you only get to to put one actually to the panel. Um, but I, I was thinking, you know, uh, well, I'll let you do your one. I think the one on technology struck me as maybe being the most relevant and, and an issue that's not been tackled yet, uh, I think, sufficiently in, in our conversation. So, Bill, do you mind doing your technology question? Uh, well, sure. And thank you for the opportunity to ask such a distinguished panel uh, these questions. Uh, so on technology, we've seen a pull forward of technology uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, obviously, as we reopen uh, and, uh, you know, the economy is going to be a different economy uh, in many respects. So there's going to be structural uh, unemployment issues that uh, we're going to have to deal with. So the question revolves around uh, the use of policy and all of this debt financing. How should we think about um, policy in trying to build back productive GDP in this new environment and dealing with the structural issues that are uh, you know, now in place and are probably only going to accelerate. Thanks, I'm gonna take one more question from, from uh, the folks here and Neil Carmichael. Neil, if we could call on you, because I think you had a, uh, a, well, a number of interesting questions. The one that struck me was the one about the risks of deindustrialization, the rise of nationalism, the, some of the politics that Philip was talking about uh, very much at the beginning and that Raghu addressed as well. Over to you, Neil, if you could unmute, please. Ah, hold on, you're muted. And if we can't unmute you, you need to unmute yourself, Neil, if you can, I think. Otherwise, I'll ask your question on your behalf. Uh, I don't see you unmuting or being able to be unmuted. So there's obviously some blank there. Don't worry about it. I can see your participant on the list. So just uh, for our panelists and others, Neil Carmichael's uh, question was specifically about whether technology uh, might, which might accelerate through this process of the COVID uh, recovery, could end up actually driving some quite deep disruption to social contracts, to employment opportunities. And where do you see that fitting into the uh, uh, the kind of build back uh, agenda. So, uh, Deanne, I'm sorry, as you've been with us longest, you're going to go in the deep end on these very complicated and somewhat disconnected questions. I'm going to turn to Deanne, then to Raghu, and then see if some of our um, paper authors want to come in either to comment or ask another question on any of these points, as we've got you all here and you've done a lot of the hard work. Uh, Deanne first. Well, I think I should say thank you, but uh, yeah, these are, these are tough questions and, and important questions. Um, I, I guess I would say to, to Andre Hoffman's point, I think there is some scope for using impact investment or maybe even um, carbon offsets as a vehicle to transfer resources from either countries or companies who, who do need to emit, airlines I'm thinking of in particular, maybe steel companies, uh, to, to allow them develop a more robust and a more um, verifiable system than we have right now, but to allow that transfer to take place, which could indeed be directed towards not just carbon issues, but biodiversity or, or other things. Uh, and I would hope, I know there are discussions taking place, whether they come up with anything, I'm, I'm not so sure. Uh, on the questions on technology and structural change, uh, you know, th this has kind of happened. It's uh, the acceleration of digitization, um, both by you know people like us and the way we talk to each other today, but also by companies. Uh, it it's happening, and indeed, I think I mean I've been surprised at how quickly it's happened and how many companies have actually pivoted quite quickly, uh, given the constraints over the past year. So. I mean, I, I don't think there's a huge new role for government, uh, 
in, in helping this structural change take place. Obviously, education, re-education, training, apprenticeships, all these things that we've been trying to do for years perhaps become even more important. Um, but we will need to, we'll, I have an open mind at least about how disruptive this is gonna be. We should watch the unemployment figures, see what happens. Um, I think some of these changes are taking place and many of them are positive changes uh, that probably don't require too much more uh, additional support. That's great. Um, Raghu, any comments on the questions that have come through so far? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, just uh, amplifying a little bit uh, on what Diane has already said. Uh, I mean, I, I do think, uh, uh, you know, we are seeing uh, firms adapt significantly, uh, increase the pace of automation, robots, the investment in robots are, uh, uh, you know, increasing tremendously. And of course, we've seen uh, how to work at a distance far more effectively. Uh, silver lining, this should enhance productivity and the restructuring of work uh, should um, allow us to uh, benefit uh, from the improvements from the uh, communications and technology revolution. The question is, how do you distribute this, these productivity gains uh, to a wider base? And, and I would certainly agree that we need to make adjustments on the educational front. We've tried that for a long time. We need to do better. Maybe we can use technology to do it better. But I also think there is scope for social adjustment. And, and what I mean by that is maybe we now see the possibility of distributed production, even in advanced countries, uh, through this working at a distance. The small town now has a lot more professionals because they work in London but, uh, but go in once a week. And so incomes can get more widely distributed. And then the question is how to make those incomes work so that they employ a broader set of people uh, who may be uh, you know, not producing stuff, but actually providing a variety of services. Uh, and we have the opportunity of addressing many of the ills that plague us. For example, the disease of loneliness, which I understand is, is huge in, in, in the UK. But can we think, and this is where there may be some scope for reinventing government in a certain sense, maybe local government, but thinking about what kinds of structures we have uh, now that we are producing more to effectively use it uh, to create a happier society. So, so I think there is a scope for reinventing some of the, thing, the things we do, but I would agree with Deanne, let's see how this proceeds. I think we are jump too quickly to, yeah, we're working at a distance, so all the offices are gonna be empty. Well, maybe, but maybe people will rediscover after a year and a half of working at home with a two-year-old, that makes sense to go back to the office. So we need to figure out what real change happens but I, I would think there's an opportunity to, to, to build on it. We're, we're coming into the last two or three minutes and uh, it's been a you know, full two hour session. We lost our break. So um, I don't want to um, uh, keep people on. Hopefully you've all been looking at the very good questions uh, that are in the list, including lots of the ones we won't be getting to. Uh, so please use those as sort of good information and, and, and thank everyone for the good questions that people put in there. I thought there was one sort of appropriately, perhaps anonymous question uh, or from an anonymous participant that is a nice kind of wrapper upper. Um, what I uh, am going to do is pose that wrapper upper to, uh, to Philip, to Deanne, to, to Raghu in this second half, you know, to close up the second half. But I can see a few of our paper authors uh, on the, in my gallery view on the screen. Uh, wave at me right now if any of you have a point you want to come in on before I uh, allow our, our three closing panelists to say some closing words. You're not waving. I'm looking at you. Okay, in that case, uh, uh, thank you very much for your contributions. What I am going to say is just turn Philip, first to Philip, then to Diane, then to Raghu. Here's the question. Um, do you have any deep worries about financial stability in the medium term? Um, I've been interested that the word inflation hasn't cropped up much in our conversation. We've had technology, inequality, uh, climate, we have all the good things that I expect to be in there, but that was on that list that the questioner posed in the Q&A line. You know, house price bubbles. We've hardly said the word China in this at all. Um, Philip, if you were sitting in your old seat there, um, either near-term or medium-term ones, uh, are there some things we've not worried about that we really need to, to keep an eye on? So I'm glad you made that distinction because, of course, um, if I was sitting in my old seat, I'd probably have a 
a, a, a resolutely clear two to three year time horizon. And I don't think I have huge concerns on that uh, on that uh, time horizon. But going beyond that, yes, I do. I think one of the things we've touched on today is um, perhaps that's worth just coming back to for a minute. Um, you know, did the Basel um, system work? And, and the, I think the conclusion we've reached is that we don't know because it hasn't really been tested because it's been, you know, been obscured by a sea of liquidity drowning everything. Um, but there's another problem here. Um, is the Basel system going to be undermined by an implicit assumption that any challenge to financial stability will always be responded to with this same kind of you know, off the scale fiscal and monetary um, largesse. Um, and, I, and I think somebody said earlier, I can't remember if it was um, Deanne, but somebody said earlier that, you know, the whole point of the, um, of, of the Basel reforms was to create these sort of buffers within the system that wouldn't require this massive external stimulus. So why, why do I worry about this? I, I work, again, from a politician standpoint, the thing that worries me because we saw it in 2008 on what we thought then was a massive scale, but we've now, we now realize that actually that was just the hors d'oeuvre, um, the main course has just happened. Um, we've seen a, a huge injection of um, liquidity and we've seen, I think, most of that um, going towards asset price inflation rather than um, strengthening wages. And we're, we're certainly in the developed world, we're already living in an environment where there are really significant tensions building up between those who own assets and those who don't. That's not just a rich and poor divide, it's a young and old divide as well. And the politics of this is pretty um, toxic. Um, you know, at a time when millions of people are on furlough, um, their incomes are under pressure, and they, you know, they open their newspaper and they see that the stock market has risen 60% um, over the period of the crisis. Um, and wh where do we go from here? Uh, how do we manage the political fallout of um, increasing inequality through the feeding of asset price inflation? Thank you. That's a really important point to have raised, and, and I'm glad you put it on the agenda. I noted, I think, in the newspaper yesterday that uh, we're in the situation where European banks are now as exposed or more exposed to the, their national sovereign debt than they were uh, in the lead it to 2007, 2008. So, to your point, Philip, you know, we maybe just got into ourselves into a new uh, uh, dilemma. Diane, over to you. Yeah, I, I, I certainly agree with everything that Philip has said. And I think it, it also illustrates that we always have to worry about financial stability risks. Uh, we are living in a very interdependent financial world where a problem in one place very quickly uh, spills over to other places. We're also living in a world with very high leverage. Uh, and that's uh, true, not just in the banking system, but in the shadow banking world. Uh, we, we have a lot going on that doesn't actually go through regulated intermediaries these days. And uh, so we don't really know how much to worry about them, but I, but I think we have to. And then there is this issue of, of asset prices um, that uh, at, at some point they will become really overvalued. Uh, and probably that point will have something to do with what happens to interest rates. And personally, I worry about whether central banks, particularly uh, the Fed, um, but maybe this country as well, and in Britain, whether those, whether they will have the courage uh, and the political space to raise interest rates when the time comes, they are not going to stay at this level uh, for the for the long term, and maybe not even the immediate term. So yes, I worry about all those things. Plenty to worry about, as always. Um, Raghu, last word to you. Just need to unmute. I agree with everything Philip and Deanne said. Uh, I mean, look at debt. Uh, just look at it from 1975. It's been on an upward trajectory if you look at public debt in industrial countries, and we just added a huge uh, amount to it. But it's not just public debt, it, corporate debt up 10%, uh, according to the IMF over the, over the pandemic. Household debt up 5%, not in every country, but on average. 
Uh, and this is on top of the 15 to 20 percent increase in public debt. So uh, we are spending. Uh, and the question is, when does the cost hit us? What were, you know, there is a school which I think is extremely dangerous, which says, don't worry, be happy. Interest rates are really low. Spend all you need and essentially spend with uh, the idea that no one should suffer. And I think that is really bad public policy because, uh, you know, uh, that means uh, probably excessive spending. And the costs obviously are not paid in the short term, they are paid in the medium to long term when you limit fiscal space to do other things. In fact, in the US, we are already seeing that. Uh, uh, the CARES Act plus the two subsequent bills, uh, five trillion, now we're really fighting about what actually is important investment uh, because this now we have to pay for. And this is when you know, it starts hitting uh, that you know, this is not free money. And, and so what we're going to get is a shrunken investment package, uh, which is essentially uh, important, even while we've sort of, uh, and, and there are various reasons why the spending has been so easy. I think many of them rooted in political economy, many of them in some of the things that uh, Philip has, 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 has mentioned. But, uh, but I think we, we, we really have to be worried that uh, you know, even if we don't have a financial, explicit financial crisis, uh, that this uh, level of buildup is unsustainable, and uh, and somewhere it has to stop. And the question is, how does it stop? Uh, even while we are having a really big strategic competition, uh, you, you mentioned China that we haven't spoken about, a increasing amount of strategic competition between the democracies of the world. And, uh, and a very successful uh, regime. So thus far, at least, let me stop. Well, sorry, I'm sorry, um, I'm keeping it on time. Thank you, Raghu, for, for those comments. I think all of your, your three very thoughtful comments today and obviously the great inputs we've had from our paper writers is a reminder why um, we are putting so much focus and centrality on this area and will be, this is a launch event um, of current uh, thinking convened and, and produced by, by Chatham House around these big questions of the future of, of international economic cooperation and stability. Um, I would just underscore as well within this that uh, as a core part of this, I think we want to make sure that we always connect to it the sustainability of the solution. And it's not just the economic sustainability or even just the political sustainability in the short term, but the environmental sustainability, uh, the climate sustainability of the answers that we are uh, putting together here, because these elements are all interwoven. Politicians obviously have to deal with what's on their plate today, but the whole point of a think tank like Chatham House is to be able to look that little bit further into the future and, and try to keep uh, uh, politicians and others' eyes uh, on the big changes that are ahead of us. And in that sense, the sustainability part of the answers is so critical, not just climate, but uh, the whole natural environment as well. Um, uh, and that ties in obviously into inequality and all of the elements that you've addressed. So a big thank you to the participants. Uh, so many who've joined us, all of those who've stayed with us for the full two hours, great sets of questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you again to the paper writers who are with us here today. I can see you on my screen. Thank you for all of your hard work putting together great ideas. And a huge thank you, uh, Philip, Diane, Raghu for uh, sharing a big chunk of your time this afternoon and giving us some really thoughtful feedback and ideas for us to pick up as we go forward. And we look forward to keeping you very much involved in, in our work as we develop it further. Creon, thank you uh, for pulling this together. And obviously Stephen's been in it as well. Um, great to, 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 to have this um, coinciding with a big public debate right now around uh, the spring of 2021 for the future. Thank you. Thanks Sam and the team behind all of this for making it happen. See you soon, but great ideas. We'll feast on them for a while. All the best, bye-bye. <laughs>